Hello and welcome to the Beat Cancer Answer, brought to you by BeatCancer.org, the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. We believe that 90% of all cancers could be eliminated through environmental and lifestyle choices alone, and science agrees. Unfortunately, most people don't know it. So we provide the education that can help you prevent, cope with, and beat cancer through diet, lifestyle, and other immune-boosting approaches. On every podcast, we will feature an expert who can teach us how to become part of that 90% who could prevent getting diagnosed with cancer. If you already have cancer, we have empowering information for you too. Over the past 40 years, we have helped thousands of cancer patients get back into the driver's seat when it comes to their personal journey of healing cancer and preventing future reoccurrence. On this episode, Deborah Melamed interviews Dr. Peter Osborne, author of No Grain, No Pain on Autoimmunity and Cancer. Hello, this is Deborah Melamed from Beat Cancer, and I am here today with Dr. Peter Osborne. Dr. Osborne, often referred to as the gluten-free warrior, is one of the most sought-after alternative and nutritional experts in the world. He's the clinical director of Origins Healthcare in Sugarland, Texas, where his practice centers on helping nutritionally support those with painful chronic degenerative and autoimmune problems using natural methods. He is a nationally recognized leader in functional medicine and one of the world's leading authorities on gluten sensitivity. He lectures nationally to both the public as well as doctors on this and many other nutritionally related topics. He is the founder of the Gluten-Free Society, the author of the Gluten-Free Health Solution, and the author of the best-selling book, No Grain, No Pain. Dr. Osborne has served as the Executive Director and the Vice President for the American Clinical Board of Nutrition, and he is on the Advisory Board for Functional Medicine University. He's been featured on Fox News, CBS, PBS, Celiac.com, The Gluten Summit, The Truth About Cancer, the Journal of Gluten Sensitivity, and many other nationally recognized publications. You can also find him at drpeterosborne.com and on Facebook. And please pick up a copy of his book, No Grain, No Pain, for more information. So welcome, Dr. Osborne. It's so wonderful to have you with us today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. I've been on your Facebook page and... I went on to the Truth About Cancer live event, and I listened to your talk. It was very interesting. Um, you focused on cancer being end-stage autoimmunity, and the auto, that autoimmunity is precancer. And um, so many people in the United States have autoimmune disease, and so many have cancer. So I really wanted to talk about this link and the connection, um, if you could explain this to everyone, what the connection is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, autoimmune disease affects an estimated 46 million, and that's an underestimation by most expert opinions. Um, but the problem with autoimmunity is that it's classified into about 90 different conditions. So unlike cancer, when we look at cancer, you know, you all, we hear that cancer is either the number one or the number two killer uh, in the in the United States today, but cl cancers are lumped together. So we lump in, you know, all the different forms of cancer, whether you have lung cancer or bone cancer or liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, all the different kinds of cancers are lumped together to, to accumulate those statistics. But as it relates to autoimmunity, uh, it, statistically, autoimmunity is separated out into 90 different diseases. So people don't really realize the huge impact that autoimmunity actually has. And again, 46 million estimated, and that's a low estimation of people with a form of autoimmune disease. And just to give your audience an example of autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's, which affects the thyroid. Graves also affects the thyroid. We have other forms of autoimmunity that affect the joints like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and scleroderma and dermatomyositis and psoriatic arthritis. We have autoimmune conditions that affect the skin like vitiligo and dermatitis herpetiformis and eczema and psoriasis 
We have autoimmune disease that affects the liver, which is oftentimes referred to as autoimmune hepatitis. We have autoimmune disease now being identified in the bone. Osteoporosis has now been classified as an autoimmune disease. Diabetes has been classified as an autoimmune disease. And I'm not talking about type 1 diabetes, which many people are aware of. Type 1 is when when the pancreas is being attacked by the immune system and we lose the ability to produce insulin. I'm talking about type 2 adult onset diabetes now as being shown to have an autoimmune component to it. So we've got all of these different forms of autoimmune disease being separated statistically. So none of them get the credit for being part of this family of autoimmune disease. Again, cancer is kind of a family and all those mo- all those diagnoses are clumped together with autoimmunity not so if we were to clump all the autoimmune diseases together it would be the number one killer in the United States and as autoimmunity is a precursor we I, I call it precancer and the reason why think of it like this initially what autoimmunity is is when the immune system gets confused in a sense it, it the immune system is dysregulated it starts to attack the body's own tissues and this isn't by accident. The body isn't stupid. What happens uh, with autoimmunity, there are a couple of different kind of pre, um, pre-occurrences that happen before autoimmune disease sets in. One is this condition known as intestinal hyperpermeability. Some people call it leaky gut. It's when the gut has microscopic pores in it so that the food and the bacteria in the food can actually leak into the bloodstream without being properly checked by the immune system. And those things set off the immune system in a very aggressive way. So what happens is the the breakdown in the gut leads to an overreactive immune system. And again, that's not a mistake of the immune system. The immune system's just doing its job. It's just saying, hey, look, these things don't belong in the bloodstream, but the gut's broken. We need to attack these things. And some of these things that slip through from a leaky gut into the bloodstream are food proteins. Some of them are bacterial proteins or viral proteins. And some of these proteins look like our tissue. So for example, um, one of the really well-studied and well-known um, autoimmune processes is that gluten, which many people have heard at this point of a gluten-free diet or of gluten, but the protein gluten itself can trigger an autoimmune response through leaky gut. And one of the reasons why is that some of the elements of gluten protein look like your thyroid. So some people with gluten sensitivity when that gluten is leaking through their gut into their immune system, their immune system is attacking that gluten. But that some of those gluten proteins look like the thyroid. So okay. over time, that's why it's called molecular mimicry. The molecules leaking through mimic the human tissue. And then the immune system, which is doing its job, it's just attacking this thing that's leaking through the gut. It starts to turn its attention on the thyroid. And it starts to attack the thyroid. And this is where autoimmune disease of the thyroid can start to set in. So we have this process of leaky gut followed by this process of molecular mimicry followed by this process of autoimmunity, which again means the immune system is just being ramped up and turned on and its attention is diverted away from the environment. So away from environmental allergens, away from viruses and bacteria, and it's being turned onto our own bodies. And over time, the more our immune system attacks our own body, over time, our immune reserve starts to dwindle. You know, we don't have an endless amount of immune soldiers. And so over time, as we use up those immune soldiers, our immune system then starts to become more in the line of deficit. So we start to develop an immune deficiency, and this is where cancer sets in. Cancers occur as a result of an immunodeficit individual. And so with autoimmunity, it's it's your immune system gets turned on and abused for so long that then over time it becomes so weak that the cancer is allowed to flourish. So it's so, something that we're eating that's actually irritating the gut and causing the leaky gut, particularly gluten? Well, it can be. And I, I wrote No Grain, No Pain explaining a lot of that. It's, it's gluten, but it's also other grains, but it's also not just grain itself. There's this old adage, you've heard it, one man's food is another man's poison, right? Everybody, you know, has their own unique environment, their own unique DNA, and their own unique interactions with their food, etc. And if we eat food we're allergic to, 
consistently. And, and most people think, well, I'm not allergic to a food because I don't feel bad when I eat it. But there's two kinds of allergies. There's an acute allergy, which is you eat something and your lips swell, your throat constricts, you break out in hives. Most people don't have that kind of allergy. There's a secondary type of allergy called a delayed hypersensitivity. And this is you eat something and it doesn't create an adverse symptom immediately. It creates a low-grade inflammation inside your body that overstimulates your immune system over time. So, so think of it as a as a an allergy that occurs in an insidious manner as opposed to this obvious blatant attack when you eat something. Now, does that type of delayed hypersensitivity start as a result of leaky gut or is that just something that could just happen? Both. Okay. Both. So one of the things that happens is, so understand that 75 to 80% of the immune system is right behind the gut wall. And the name of that immune system is called the gastro-associated lymphoid tissue or the GALT, G-A-L-T. And it's there on purpose, by design. It's because when we eat, we eat good and bad. You know, understand that the act of eating itself, we're eating... And the whole premise of our GI tract, the whole purpose is to separate good from bad and let the good in, let the vitamins and the minerals and the nutrients into our bloodstream so that our body can use those to heal, repair, and grow. But also the job of the GI tract is to expel the waste and expel the things that could be potentially harmful to us. Because every time we eat, we're eating bacteria, we're eating viruses, we're eating molds, we're eating those things every time we put food in our body. It's just that it's our gut's job to discriminate good from bad and eliminate bad and keep the good. So if the gut is broken, if the gut is damaged, then and it, then it can't do its job effectively, though that's where leaky gut comes in. Then those foods that we're eating that have bad things in them can penetrate through that lining and overstimulate the immune system. So so there, there are two kinds of allergies. I want you to think of it like this because I want to answer your question, which is, are, are these allergies occurring as a result of a leaky gut or are these allergies just already in existence? The answer to that is both. Some people have what are called true allergies where they're truly allergic to something. Their bodies just don't like that and so they're going to react to that. And then there's something called an acquired allergy and that is when there's a fundamental breakdown in the immune process as in a leaky gut, a person become, can become more allergic to some of the things that they're getting frequent exposure to and that's when the problems can really set in as well. Yeah, I know what you're talking about because I've had these problems. I guess you need to heal the gut and then also test to see what's bothering you. So part of healing the gut is to determine what a person should and shouldn't be eating by asking the immune system, the, the individual's immune system. Because a lot, there are a lot of books out there, health books, and, 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 and there are a lot of really smart doctors that write books. And, but all books are generalizations, meaning that, that they're providing a platform that is very generalized across the board saying if you apply the information from this book, you'll feel better, right? But what I like to do in my clinic is when, when a patient comes in to see me, I like to do individualized testing because we can ask a person's own immune system what it doesn't like. So I can do advanced testing that determines what a person is allergic to from an acute perspective or from a delayed perspective. And when we have that information in our hands, then we can alter the diet so that it accommodates the person's health instead of helping to contribute to a chronic level of inflammation. Okay. Because you can be eating, thinking you're eating very healthy, but it could just be something you happen to be allergic to and you have no idea. Right, exactly. Because, you know, health is relative. The food that we're eating, I, look, I had, a, I had a patient one time, one of the most unique cases I'd ever seen was allergic to blueberries. And that patient had a terminal diagnosis, meaning they had six months to live. And we found out that blueberries were a big part of the issue. And once we figured that part out and we changed the diet, they made a full recovery. So, wow, so it incredible. can be something, yeah, it can be something that is completely healthy that we all perceive to be healthy, but for that individual isn't. So then that's very important to get tested in a way with a functional medicine doctor, I guess. There's certain tests. Absolutely. I know there's I mean, a lot of confusion about the testing for that also. Well, there is. There's a lot of confusion because a lot of doc – look, the reality is this, and this is not me saying anything bad about medical doctors. 
Um, because I love medical doctors. I have a lot of great friends who are medical doctors, and I think medicine is the best solution for acute care management of, of emergency medicine. But when it comes to chronic diseases like cancer and autoimmune disease, we have a track record where giving and dispensing medicine to alleviate symptoms of chronic disease doesn't work. And we know it doesn't work. It's a major, major problem. We spend trillions of dollars a year on drugs that don't lead to an outcome that that heal or cure these chronic degenerative diseases like cancer and autoimmune disease. These people continue to suffer and and the medicine doesn't fix it. So we have a broken system. And the problem is, is that in medicine, doctors don't train in, in, in fundamental biochemistry of nutrition. There's less than seven hours required by most medical schools. And if you sit in on those classes, most of those nutritional classes being taught in medical school aren't classes that teach about the value of nutrition. They teach about the in and unimportance of nutrition. Nutrition. They teach about how, oh how unimportant it actually is. So when a doctor graduates with a medical license, they don't really have any great training in nutrition, but the patient thinks they do. So it's really the patients are under a misconception. Understand that a license to practice medicine means that the doctor is licensed to dispense pharmaceuticals or to perform surgeries to alleviate symptoms by artificially manipulating chemistry, not by providing a lifestyle or a diet change or analyzing nutrition to determine why a person might be sick in the first place. I mean, we have to go back and honor food. Food is a drug. It's the ultimate drug. It, you, you know, we think about what is the definition of a drug. It's, it's a drug is anything that can change the way we think, feel, or act. And if you've ever seen a two-year-old take sugar for the first time, you know sugar's a drug. Food can act as a drug because it's chemical information that the body has to perceive, take in, and do something with. And if we don't honor the fact that food is one of the most fundamental, important premises to, to health, then we're completely missing the boat on chronic degenerative diseases. And that's where we're at right now is that patients go in to see their doctor and they have, they have a misconception that the doctor has a, an expertise in nutrition. And so when, when they have that misperception and that doctor's telling them nutrition has nothing to do with your cancer, nutrition has nothing to do with your autoimmune disease, then the patients are hearing that message and believing it because they think that the doctor is an expert in nutrition when in fact that doctor has less than seven hours of training. Now, I mean, I'm, and I don't say this to brag either. I have over 10,000 hours of nutritional training. And there's a huge discrepancy. Just like a surgeon has over t maybe over 10,000 hours of performing surgeries and doing surgeries, I would never go out there and try to be a surgeon exactly. or put myself out there and say I'm an expert in that and then deter my patient away from that as if I were the expert in it. And But that's, again, that's part of the problem. It's the communication. If a doctor... If a doctor steps up and says, look, I know I'm not an expert in nutrition, uh, so I'm not really even qualified to make, the, to make the statement that nutrition has nothing to do with this disease, why don't we send you to somebody who is an expert in nutrition and let's get their opinion and let's work this thing out together. I think that's really what's missing from, exactly. from the professionals today. And if we could get the patient to demand more of that from their doctors, I think we could change the paradigm of cancer. Right, because nobody got sick from a deficit of a prescription drug. So Bingo, exactly. We are missing, and you were saying that traditional treatment of autoimmunity can actually cause cancer, which it can. I found it can. Alarming. So let's talk about that, and, and vice versa. Traditional treatment of autoimmunity can cause cancer, and traditional treatment of cancer can cause autoimmunity. So we have two problems there. Um, let me give you a few different examples of this. Um, if we look at certain kinds of autoimmune disease, some of the treatments are immune suppressing medications, what are called DMARDs, disease modifying antirheumatic drugs, um, or the biologics. These are drugs that dramatically suppress the immune system's ability to fight. And the, the reason they're given for patients with autoimmune disease is because the immune system is attacking them. So then the doctors are giving the drug to suppress the immune system. But the problem is when you suppress the immune system, you increase the risk for the development of cancer. And this has been very well established, and there are a number of studies that have been published in major medical journals, peer-reviewed journals, that demonstrate this process occurs on a regular basis. Now, then we have the opposite of that as well. Let me give you a very specific example. So a lot of times what happens in breast cancer is the doctors want to put patients on, uh, on medications that alter 
uh, estrogen uh, estrogen receptors. And many of these types of drugs, so like like in breast cancer, they want to they want to use certain types of drugs for several years after the cancer is defeated. And those very drugs can actually trigger autoimmune disease. So you've got again, you've got this scenario that goes both ways. So if if autoimmune disease itself is not caused by a drug deficiency and cancer is not caused by a drug deficiency, but the way that they're both being dealt with is through the administration of drugs to manipulate symptoms and outcomes and the administration of those drugs lead to both cancer and autoimmune disease, who wins? The only person like that wins in that cycle. scenario, yeah, the only person that wins in that scenario is the, is the drug company making the money off of the sale of those medications. And that's, again, that's part of the problem is that we, it's hard to get a real answer uh, because, you know, I mean, if we look at commercial advertising in the United States, in, in the United States is one of the only countries in the world that allows direct to consumer drug advertising because most countries consider it to be very unethical practice. But right. in the U.S., we allow it. Well, six, I, don't quote me on this exactly, but I believe the last time I looked this up, it was 60% of all ad revenue was actually basically medications. It was, it was, it was the 60% of all ad revenue on commercials, on TV, on radio comes from pharmaceutical companies buying ads. Well, that's a lot of power, right? And, and so think of the influence. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'm a realist, right? And money talks. And so when people, when, when, when pharmacy says, hey, you know what? We buy 60% of your ad space. I don't like this other person you're letting advertise on your radio talking about nutrition. Or I don't like this other person advertising about, about health and wellness on the TV show. I don't like that person's message. We want you to get rid of that person. And I can tell you from, from my own personal experience, I was blacklisted from several uh, national appearances uh, because of the message in no grain, no pain. No, the message in no grain, no pain is not anti-medicine. The message is perceived as anti-medicine by pharmacy, but the message is common sense. The message is medications don't fix the problem. If you've got an acute disease, you need to, you need to see uh, a, a doctor. If you've got an infection and you're going to die from a bacterial infection, you need an antibiotic. But if you've got a chronic disease that needs to be addressed with diet and lifestyle, the medicine is never going to fix that, and they don't like that message. No, they don't. <laughs> so, so if someone has an autoimmune disease, do you suggest that I guess they need to start getting tested to see what foods might be bothering them? Would that be the first step? So there's, there's four steps. And because there's four causes or triggers that we know of for autoimmune disease. And this is a very well-established fact. Trigger number one is food. And we learned that in 1952 by the work of a great uh, physician, a Dutch physician named William Dickey, who discovered the cause of celiac disease. By the way, celiac disease is a form of small intestinal autoimmune disease. And he discovered that the cause of celiac disease was gluten. So that was our first known established cause for autoimmune disease. And since then, we've discovered that other foods can do it too. Okay. So we know food is a trigger. So food has to be ruled out. Now, that's not the only trigger. One of the other known triggers is, is chemical exposure. Now, there have been several studies that show heavy metals like mercury and lead and aluminum and cadmium and arsenic can be a trigger factor in autoimmune disease. But that's not it. Just, it's not just heavy metals. We've got studies that show that pesticides can be a trigger for autoimmune disease. Um, as a matter of fact, in areas where crop dusting is done on a real regular basis, we see higher incidences of autoimmune diseases in those in those uh, communities. So chemicals have to be ruled out. And so pesticides and heavy metals are two very common chemicals that we're all exposed to on a pretty aggressive regular basis. But they're not the only two types of chemicals. There are chemicals in cosmetics. There's chemicals in your water. There's chemicals in the air. There's chemicals in plastic water bottles. There are chemicals all around us. So I like to test for chemicals as well because if a person is overreacting to specific types of chemicals, look, that's easy to change. We can set up special air filtration. We can put in special water filters. We can tell a person to quit using a cosmetic with the chemical that they're allergic to. And that's, those are easy changes. So food and chemicals. The third trigger factor is infection. And most people think of infection as like a cold or a flu um, and I'm not talking about colds and flus. I'm talking about chronic infections. And I'm going to give you a few different examples. Have you ever heard of H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori? 
Yes, I have. Okay, it's a bacteria that can get into the stomach, and if it overgrows, it can create ulcers. And this, this won a Nobel Prize in Medicine in 19, 1998. It, the discovery of this won a Nobel Prize in Medicine. So that type of infection, oftentimes uh, it's referred to, we kind of refer to them as stealth infections because they don't cause the fever. They don't cause the, the malaise that we might see in like a cold or a flu. They cause other problems altogether. So as in the case of H. pylori, the bacterial infection, we see ulcers in the stomach. We see acid reflux. But there are other types of infections. For example, Lyme disease, which is a bacterial infection, can create autoimmune fibromyalgia. And that's, that's been well established. So again, an infection that creates, instead of creating a, a cold or a flu, creates a, mus a chronic muscle pain or a chronic neurological pain uh, perceptive change. And then we have other infections like Klebsiella and Pseudomonas and yeast infections that have been known in, to trigger Hashimoto's and rheumatoid arthritis. So, so again, these types of infections don't manifest as, as what we would typically think about an infection for. And they just, it's like bacteria or a microorganism set up shop in, in your different tissues and create a chronic inflammation that leads to an autoimmune reaction in that tissue. So those are also things that we want to rule out. So we want to rule out what I call stealth infections or chronic infections that are not colds and flus. Is Epstein-Barr another one? It is. Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus. Um, these are, and even herpes simplex. I mean, understand that, that the viruses, the, there are different viruses, and they love to go dormant and live in our nerve tissue. And when our immune systems are weak enough, they come out and play. They come out and they create a symptomatic response that just overwhelms the immune system. Okay. So, so those can actually be parts of this process as well. Then we have the fourth trigger, which is nutritional deficiency. And so this is less of something that you, that you get exposed to and more of something that you don't get exposed to enough of. So, so in essence, like for example, vitamin D deficiency is known to, is known to be a co-trigger in rheumatoid arthritis and in type 1 diabetes, both autoimmune diseases. Vitamin, uh, vitamin C deficiency is a trigger, can be a trigger point for autoimmunity. Zinc deficiency can be a trigger point for autoimmunity. So nutritional deficit, when a person's diet doesn't provide enough of the vitamins and minerals that are essential for health and they become deficient for a long enough period of time, remember what vitamins and minerals do. They regulate the functions of the body, particularly in this case, they regulate the function of the immune system. So if you're missing one of these immune important nutrients, your immune system can, can start to malfunction and go haywire. So we've got to look at those four primary triggers as a fundamental starting point. And, and you can have a deficiency because of leaky gut also. It could be an absorption issue. It can be. So let's let's take it one step further. Let's say you've got somebody who has an H. pylori infection, so they have acid reflux symptoms. Now, they don't really have acid reflux. They have acid reflux symptoms. Right. The, the big difference there, right, because the, right. the bacteria is what's creating the damage, not too much acid. So, so unless that bacteria is identified, what most doctors will do is put that patient on an acid-suppressing medication. Now, when you suppress stomach acid, it causes magnesium deficiency, zinc deficiency, calcium, and vitamin D deficiencies. And so oh, the medicine boy. itself leads to the deficiency. The longer you're on it, the more likelihood you are to have developed that deficiency, and you still haven't addressed the underlying reason the problem exists. We wow. do the same thing with steroids. A person goes in and let's say they have a diagnosis of like a rheumatoid arthritis or a lupus and the doctor puts them on a steroid. That steroid blocks calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, and zinc. So understand that you need magnesium to regulate immune cell development. You need vitamin D to regulate how immune cells behave and respond to the environment. So if you're taking a steroid that causes those deficiencies, the long-term outcome is that you're actually creating an immune system that gets very confused and doesn't know what to do. Very but interesting. You're, but you're also blocking calcium, so now you're causing bone loss, right? And you're causing muscle cramps and muscle spasms. And remember that I said that this – in the example I gave here, I said lupus, which is a painful – disease that affects muscles and tendons and ligaments. And, and if you're giving a drug that causes spasms, then now you're creating symptoms of muscle pain. 
that could be confused and construed as the actual disease state. Does that make sense? So now you've got yes. more confusion. And this is, this, again, this is where doctors go wrong. I mean, I, and the reason I got into all this is I actually, I was trained in the VA hospital in the rheumatology department. And so I would see patients coming in with RA and lupus and, and uh, psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthropathies and reactive arthritis. And, and none of them ever got better with the medicines. And that was my whole, that was my whole problem with it is that all these patients that were coming in didn't get better. Um, their problems didn't go away, and, and the ones that had been on the medicines long enough, the joints still deteriorated, so they ended up having to have ortho consults, and the orthos would just recommend joint replacement surgery. So here they'd put these patients on these drugs for five-plus years, and when their joints were destroyed anyway, and now their immune systems are destroyed, and their nutritional status is completely dysregulated because the drugs cause nutritional deficiencies as well, now they want them to do a surgery. And many of these patients can't heal from the surgery because they don't have the nutritional status to heal. So they put them under the knife, which surgery is scheduled trauma, right? And then they expect that that joint replacement is going to work, but now the patient can't heal from the surgery. So now they become on chronic disability because the surgery was a failed was a failed outcome, and now they have a, a scar that's not healing. They have this chronic inflammation because their body just can't heal because it's so nutritionally uh, deficient as a result of what was done to treat their illness. And I just so couldn't. They're getting, I, so they're getting a band aid at a very high cost and never got to the root cause. Right, and that's it's a high cost to them physically, emotionally. From a, from a frustration point of why do I have this disease? Why is this happening to me? Why can't I get better? Why can't I get an answer? That's very debilitating to a person. It is. But then there's also the financial cost. So whether the person's paying out of pocket or whether the person's buying the insurance and then their insurance rates go up or whether they're, or whether they're on like Medicare or in my case, I was in the VA hospital, it's a huge cost to the taxpayer. And to me, the taxpayer should not be responsible for paying for treatments that don't work and have horrible outcomes. We should have right. a system that works better than that. Wow. That's really huge. So I guess um, people really need to get with a doctor that's going to help them get to a root cause. And uh, you talk in No Grain, No Pain about functional medicine. You have a whole chapter on it. Is this the type of care that a cancer patient or someone with autoimmune disease should seek out? In my opinion, absolutely. Because if we look at, at deaths from cancer, most of the deaths don't occur from the cancer. They occur from the treatment. Right. And a big part of that is that the side effects of chemo and radiation and, and even in cases where surgery is being done, um, the side effects can be devastating. And the side effects can destroy the gut tissue and can destroy the liver and can destroy, you know, the kidneys and the heart, et cetera. And so what's hap what happens to a lot of patients is even though they, they may have put the cancer at bay, they've destroyed the health of their whole body to such a great degree that the cancers come back. So anybody who's undergoing any type of cancer therapeutic, in my opinion, should also be seeking out a functional medicine expert at the very least to have nutritional support, solid nutritional support that is that is objective and justified to help them overcome the illness if they're not getting that you know realize that that what's going to happen ultimately is that they're the, when the cancer when the cancer grows and the and the chemo and the radiation quit working which is again this is what happens to a lot of them by that time that happens the body is is basically been so destroyed by the medications that there's no there's no turning back from it, and that's where people generally tend to tend to have a terminal diagnosis or, or die. Right. So we can stop a lot of that, and and some people want to want to live in both worlds. They want to live in con the world of conventional medicine, and then they want to live in the world of alternative medicine. And I think that's a, at the very least what they should be doing. And and the but the problem fundamentally is is that most chemo doctors that I have have had conversations with not all but and I'm I'm, I'm not generalizing uh, I am generalizing I should say I am generalizing but I'm not saying that all oncologists believe this but many of the mainstream oncologists believe that if you're using things like vitamin C or other antioxidants during your cancer treatment that you're that you're negating the effect of the chemo and they tell their patients not to not to have good nutrition during their treatment because it will negate the chemo effect. And I just don't believe it that you can poison the body to death 
in an effect to be a disease that we know is caused by bad nutrition. Because if you ask any epidemiologist what causes cancer, they're going to tell you that 99% of all cancers are caused as a result of lifestyle choices. So right. how, can we, how can we support poor lifestyle choices while going through chemo and expect a person to ever recover? And the, and the answer is we can't. And that's why, they, that's why the track records are abysmal. Now, the track records for surgical rescission of, of tumors are better, uh, but certainly, you know, so, so, I mean, the success rate of removing a tumor, success, you know, and getting, and, and, and getting defined margins on that surgery of the tumor, that, the success rates for that, depending on the type of cancer, can be much higher, but they, you know, those also pose a risk for metastatic disease coming back later down the road. So I think, I think part of the problem in cancer when we look at, at treatments and the way doctors talk about cancer treatment is they use the two and the five-year survival rates as a measure of success, but they don't go beyond that. And I, and I think that's a mistake. I think if you really look at the long-term survival rates of chemo and even surgery, they're much, much less than, than um, what, they're being, what they're being proposed as. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we talked about the triggers for autoimmune disease. Are they the same triggers for cancer? Yeah, I mean, we can say that they are. I mean, we can argue very, very much in a scientific way that they are because, again, autoimmunity is pre-cancer. Now, you know, if we look at most things that we know that contribute to cancer, they're the same things that we know that contribute to autoimmune disease. There's nothing else to add to that, I mean, as far as what you feel are the biggest triggers for cancer? Well, I mean, we can add to it. I would say some of the biggest, some of the biggest things that also contribute to cancer are, are different medical interventions. You know, a lot of doctors, over, they over-prescribe CAT scans and, right. and other forms of radiative therapy because, remember, radiation is one of the things that can cause uh, precancerous and cancerous growth as well. I think we could say that um, if we look at vaccines a little bit more carefully and we follow, you know, I, and I'm probably going to make a lot of people mad by saying this, but, you know, really, I don't care. The truth has, we have to have this conversation sooner or later. But when you inject a child who's under two years of two years of age with mercury and aluminum and other adjuvants like propylene glycol, then and you're going to, yeah, yeah, it's formaldehyde, very strange. Right. You're going to run the risk of increasing uh, increasing a number of different kinds of disease, cancer being one of those. So, I, you know, I think you don't start out a person's life by injecting them with 28 different vaccines before they reach the age of two and their immune systems haven't even had a chance to develop yet. I think that's a big part of why we're seeing a, an increased growth in cancer. And I think that the way we grow our food um, you know, food is not the same as it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Today, most companies that are in charge of our food production are big corporate conglomerations that don't have any responsibility or moral or ethic um, blowback back onto the community who's buying that food, whereas before it was individually small farms, you know, small f family businesses running farms. Now we have corporate conglomerations, you know, producing most of the food and they're using genetically unproven, uh, you know, the safety hasn't been proven on these genetically modified versions of food uh, using chemicals that we know are carcinogens uh, to douse our food with as pesticides and herbicides, again, triggers. And, and then we have a government that, that creates a food guide pyramid that gets taught in our children's schools that promotes the use of these processed foods that are grown genetically modified or that are, um, that are doused with these chemicals and pesticides. And, they're, you know, it's just a conversation they're sweeping under the rug and not telling people about. So people think the food is food. I like to call it fruit, Franken food. Right. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, that's, that's a huge, huge part of cancer. And then you add to that, let's add one other thing, because you asked me, you know, what else I would add. I would add the fact that if we look at our public school systems today, they've taken away physical education in lieu of training for standardized tests. Um, and I go back to the No Child Left Behind Act, which in my opinion was a horrible, horrible bill that was passed that basically said we're going to teach – instead of teaching children an education, we're going to indoctrinate them to be able to pass a standardized test so that we can say everybody has reached a level – of education to be able to pass a certain test, but in order to do that, in order to train them to pass that test, we're going to take away hours of PE. So these children are going to grow up not getting physical education, not being taught about the importance of moving their body and controlling their body and having exercise as a part of their life and balance. 
And so by the time they graduate, they've not really been athletically inclined. And when they go into the workforce, now they're sitting in a desk in front of a computer screen for eight hours a day. So they're in a sedentary position. And remember that the body is made out of water. It's 70% water. And what happens to water when it sits and doesn't move? It stagnates. And your body sitting in a desk all day is going to stagnate as well. That water is important and the, and the movement is important to help you circulate your lymphatic fluids through your body, which are part of how we fight cancer. So that motion and that movement that circulates cerebrospinal fluid and blood and lymphatic fluid, which is part of our immune system, is all that becomes very stagnant with a sedentary lifestyle that, again, we're teaching teaching children from a very young age that it's okay to sit in a desk for eight hours and not have PE and then go out into the workforce and sit in a desk for eight hours and not have physical activity. And, and you know, here we are. And nobody's getting outside and getting vitamin D then either. Right, from right. From the sunshine, we're getting artificial light inside. Well, wow, that's pretty big, yeah. How about nutrients that you find critical for cancer prevention? What are your top nutrients? That you think so, you need for cancer yeah, prevention? Very good question. For cancer, for cancer prevention, I recommend eating only whole, unprocessed foods. So fresh fruits, vegetables, grass-fed meats, not farm-raised meats, grass-fed. People think that meat causes cancer. That's a myth. Grass-fed, right. pasture-raised animals that are healthy those those tissues are very healthy for humans to eat. So again, nuts, organic nuts, uh, organic fruits and vegetables, grass-fed or wild-caught animals are all some of the best foods with nutrient densities that will give your body what it needs to help be preventative along the lines of cancer. And if we're talking about, okay, so maybe somebody's already got a cancer diagnosis, Depending on the road that they take, if you're if you're going through oral chemotherapeutic regimens, so like if you're taking an oral pill, one of the side effects of oral chemotherapies is that they destroy the gut lining. That's why the diarrhea and the vomiting, the nausea, occur. And mm-hmm. so the two nutrients that can that can really really make or break a person and make a huge difference are vitamin B12 and folate. Not folic acid, but folate. Uh, folic acid is a synthetic folate. I'm talking about folate directly. So don't look for a supplement with folic acid. Look for a supplement with folate. But we need doses for for chemotherapy, oral chemotherapy. We need, you know, anywhere from eight to ten thousand micrograms of vitamin B12 to help the gut stay stable. And okay. we need, we also need from a folate perspective, we need two to four thousand uh, micrograms. Of, of folate to keep the gut stable. If you're not getting at least that quantity, then what's going to happen is you're going to have a higher tendency toward that diarrhea, and that diarrhea leads to malabsorption of nutrients, and so it depletes your body's ability to fight the cancer. So if we can stabilize the gut during those types of therapies, that's ideal for overall maintaining a person's good nutritional status. So those are those are if we're if we're talking about again oral agents. Now, if we're talking about you know IV agents or we're talking about just other general types of, of, of chemo or radiative therapies as, as a whole, we can use nutrients. And again, your oncologist is probably going to tell you not to do this. My advice is to get with a nutritional oncologist or, a, or an oncologist who's also trained in nutrition and get a second opinion. But there are nutrients like turmeric, which is a very, very potent anti-cancer, uh, anti-cancer herbal. There are new, nutrients like boswellia uh, and, and uh, frankincense. That's very these again very very powerful at helping fight cancer. That zinc and vitamin D and vitamin C and vitamin A and vitamin E all super super critical. What I do with with patients is I test them. I test them for their their intracellular levels of these nutrients to see if they're deficient because I want to give them targeted support based on what they absolutely need to have. But but those are some of the big ones. Um, another big, another big supplement that I think is very, very helpful for cancer support is what's called a proteolytic enzyme and proteolytic enzyme formulations are in my favorite product is something called Matrizyme, M-A-T-R-I-Z-Y-M-E, but proteolytics 
are anti-inflammatory and they've been shown to have anti-cancer properties as well. So they're one of my favorite supplements to help support anyone who's going through any type of cancer problem. Okay. I heard you talk a lot about magnesium also. Magnesium plays a role in more than 300 functions in the human body. Um, it's probably the most well-studied of all the nutrients in terms of the, the quanti quantity of different functions that it has, some of its functions in regulating the immune system, but also magnesium plays a major, major role in converting sugar into energy. And so in, in, in the cycle of taking glucose and making it into energy, there are 16 steps. Eight of them require magnesium. And so if your magnesium counts are low, again, your sugar is not going to process to energy. And if that sugar doesn't process to energy, it's going to feed cancer. So, oh, so we think about we think about how cancers are fed by sugar. That's why one of the things we want people to do is not eat sugar when they have cancer. And 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 again, magnesium deficiency makes it harder for a person to take even natural sugars, like the sugars that are naturally found in fruit, and convert those sugars into energy. So what happens even with natural sugars, if you're not capable of converting it, then that sugar can feed the cancer. Or or, or one of the other big big common problems in cancer, which is a yeast overgrowth. Um, yeast are notorious for contributing to cancer. The more sugar you have in your diet, the more likelihood you can have a yeast overgrowth. And then that, again, that's something that we want to make sure that we're, our bodies are able and capable of generating the energy from glucose through proper biochemistry metabolism. And that whole process requires a lot of magnesium. It requires all of the B vitamins. It requires zinc, copper, something called coenzyme Q10. It requires vitamin C. It requires a nutrient called choline. It requires a nutrient called inositol. So there are a lot of different nutrients involved in that metabolic pathway that allows for the promotion and conversion of sugar into energy. And if a person's deficient in any of those, they, they, their blood sugars are going to naturally ride higher and it's going to naturally feed cancer. And we want to make sure that we're stopping that from happening. Ah, oh, so if you get your blood sugar tested and it's borderline, could that be because you have a deficiency in magnesium or? It, it could be for a lot of reasons, but yes, magnesium wow. deficiency can cause elevations in blood sugar. So can chromium. Chromium is one of the most important minerals. That, chromium's nickname is called the glucose tolerance factor, GTF for short. And it, what chromium does is it produces the insulin receptor. So that the insulin receptor is the little receptor on the surface of all of your cells that bind to insulin so that glucose can leave your bloodstream and get into your cell to convert energy. And if, that, if your chromium levels are low, What's going to happen is that that sugar can't get out of your blood. It stays in your blood. And when again, when ele that's elevations in blood sugar, then your liver has to work harder and it has to convert that sugar into triglycerides and then it stores them as fat and it stores them around your heart. It stores them around your intestines. And that's what we call visceral fat, and it's the most dangerous inflammatory fat you could make. So chromium is very, very important for blood sugar regulation. So is vitamin B3, also known as niacin. Um, niacin and chromium together help to form the insulin receptor on the surface of our cells. So can people get all these levels tested? They are all able to be tested and they all should be tested. And, okay. and in my opinion, it should be malpractice to not test them. And okay. that's my opinion because, because these things are fundamental to human health. Understand when I say essential nutrients, understand what I mean by that. An essential nutrient what does that mean, essential? It means that the body cannot survive and thrive without getting that nutrient from the external environment. So if you don't have that nutrient, your body's functions will malfunction. They're essential for normal human biophysiological processes. So you have to have essential nutrients. Now, the essential nutrients all the B vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K, omega-3 fats, and then your minerals, calcium, magnesium, zinc, chromium, selenium, copper, etc., manganese. All these different minerals and trace minerals are essential, meaning we, our body cannot synthesize them from internally. We have to eat them. Okay. And so if we're not getting enough of these things or if we're taking medications that block them, okay, now we run into a problem. So, so to me, if we're talking about any chronic degenerative disease, evaluating a person's nutritional status has to be at the very top of the list as a bare bones. This has to be done as a, as a minimum 
to ensure that that person has a fighting chance at even being healthy. Okay, because even if they're eating really a lot of vegetables and maybe juicing, they may not be absorbing um, because of leaky gut issues or or maybe an infection. Um, so still getting tested is very important. Well, I live by a philosophy when somebody's sick, test, don't guess. Okay. Because for every blog post and interview and article that you're going to read in the, in, the, in the alternative community on cancer for nutrition, you're going to see an opinion. You're going to see a, a, a nutrient or a supplement that's supposed to be helpful or supposed to fight cancer or prevent cancer or whatever it is. And all that is great. But the reality is those are all generalizations. Right. And a generalization is not a specific piece of advice for an individual who is sick. And the best way to give advice to a sick individual is to test that individual uniquely what they need to do so that we can apply it. And what makes it more diff difficult is that the testing's not mainstream. This is – it's not mainstream. It's not routinely done. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And that's, yeah, that's a travesty. It, it really, a lot of the testing is, I mean, like, for example, one of the tests that I recommended to analyze nutritional status was developed at the University of Texas biochemistry department. It took 17 years to develop the test. It's one of the most advanced technologies in the world on nutritional status. But because doctors don't train in nutrition, they poo poo the test. They look at it and say, oh, that test isn't important. Oh, I don't understand that test. Therefore, it must not be important. Okay. Or I don't understand nutrition. Therefore, that test isn't important. Right. It's, I know, guess interpreting it is even more important. So there's that too. Right. So people need to seek out someone that's well versed in functional medicine and understanding how to interpret and make recommendations. Then absolutely. That's really great information. I I mean we've learned so much. I'm taking notes and. Um, People can also be a patient of yours remotely, correct? Yeah, we 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 see and 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 consult with people on a nutritional level all from all over the world. Um, I love it when they can come into the clinic because it gives me a, an upper hand. It gives me a, a you know a better ability to yeah, I could do an examination, a physical, etc. But um, we do see people remotely as well because you know frankly. Um, not everybody can can come to Texas or lives in Texas. Right. And it's hard to find really good um functional medicine doctors uh that do all these things and know how to test and interpret. Um people can they have to start being their own advocate and and looking things up and doing their own research. But I, I think we have some really good information and places to start. Um, so people should also ask for heavy metal testing, chemical testing, infection testing, and then it was nutrient testing. That's and, right. And then food allergy testing to see maybe what our bodies are reacting to. Right. And, and specifically delayed food allergy testing not just food allergy testing, because if they've had a skin prick test, that's measuring what's called acute response. Right. And I know there's IgG, and I know that maybe it's more like a snapshot, I think you were well, saying. I, yeah, IgG is limited. Remember, we have seven different kinds of immune responses, IgE, IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD, immune complex, and T cell responses are the different types of kind of delayed uh, delayed allergic responses that can happen. And so if somebody's only testing one of those pathways, they're missing a big chunk of what you could be reactive to. Okay. So even if people cut grains out totally, um, they could be allergic to coconut oil if they're trying the ketogenic diet or or anything. So it's very important to figure out exactly what you should be eating and not just what you shouldn't be eating. Exactly, exactly. What you should be eating and what you shouldn't be eating are two different things. And to have a to have a, a personal blueprint of what to follow versus a generic guess of what's generalized as good for people, to me that's a huge mistake. 
especially okay. if you're facing cancer. Look, I mean, cancer is a life-threatening illness, and you don't want to go into that with a bunch of guesswork. You want to go into that with as, as great a specificity as you can because you're going to need that specificity to win. I'm just curious, too. Do these things change over time? So say so you come up and you're allergic to almonds, and you change your diet, you start healing your gut, and your health starts improving. Do you retest? I mean, do things change then? Yes, they can. But but so again, there's there's what are called true allergies, which don't change, and then there are what are called acquired allergies, which can. Okay. And and acquired allergies, you people can become what what we call hyperallergenic. Can become more and more allergic to the environment and to the foods that they're eating as a result of a breakdown in the way their immune systems are working. Okay. And and so what breaks down their immune system? Different things. Sometimes it's medication, sometimes it's infection, sometimes it's nutritional deficit. That's why we start with those things because by starting with those things, we're covering the most fundamental aspects of what a person can do. We're trying to empower a person to make specified changes in their health so that what they're doing is unique and right for them as opposed to just, hey, maybe this will work. Wow, this is great information. Thank you very much. So I guess um, people can find you at drpeterosborne.com. Um, I went on your Facebook page. You have great videos uh, about pick your brain. <laughs> I was listening to so many talks about uh, dairy versus gluten, and um, I was listening to a talk on magnesium. So there's great information there. And then people can um, look up your clinic, Origins Healthcare, on your site, and they can call and get more information if they'd like they, to do that also. They can do that, yes. And they can and I would, pick I, up your book. And your book yeah. is on your website also, No Grain, No Pain. No Grain, No Pain. And any of your audience, if you're not tuning in every Monday evening, if you're a Facebooker, every Monday evening I have a live Q&A. And I do that because I know that not everybody can come see me. And that's just my, I call it my public service. I want to help the world be a healthier place to live. And um, and, and it's called the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. You mentioned that. So every Monday night at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, you can tune into that. And if you have general questions that you want to bring to the table for that, you know, all you have to do is tune in. And I try to get as many of that answered for you as I can. That's amazing. Thank you so much. That's great. Well, that's a great place for everyone to start, to um, start healing autoimmunity and cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Osborne. Well, you're welcome. It was a pleasure being on, and thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beat Cancer Answer. If you learned just one thing today about how to prevent, cope with, or beat cancer, then we have succeeded in our mission. For more information or assistance, visit our website at www.beatcancer.org. Remember to sign up for our educational email series and get your free gift. Join in the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, or Google+, where you can meet others who think just like you. We appreciate all of your feedback and love your suggestions. Please also remember to rate us on iTunes. Your positive ratings help us to get discovered so we can save more lives. Thank you again for listening and best wishes for good health from all of us at beatcancer.org.